I'm going to share with you something that, I, that is, the, the way I'm approaching it is relatively new. Like this is like the third time that I've, and so I'm still working it all out. So you're still part of the guinea pig group. And, but the ripple effect of this has been kind of phenomenal. And it, it has uh, been incredibly clarifying on so many different levels because, you know, Baxter Kruger and Brad Jerzak and John McMurray and Katie Skurja and Kenneth Tan, we're all friends and we're all trying to find language that is helpful, right? Um, a lot of times theologians will, they'll do theology speak, you know? And, and I get it because a lot of them are academics and they're talking to each other, right? And so it's, it's like in the scientific community, well, it's like talking to my son, actually. He has a five-year PhD in statistics. And you'd, you'd never know how brilliant he is unless you tripped into his area of expertise. And then he starts talking in a completely different language. And, um, and so in science, when you're, when you're working in science, you're using all these, this language that are shortcuts for people who know the language. And theology is kind of like that. So there's all these big words that if you, if you don't know the speak, you're going like, what's he talking about? And, and so I don't think there is an intentionality to be obscure, but they end up many times being obscure. And, um, and then they sort of get caught in that cloud where that sort of becomes their identity and then they don't know how to be human and all that kind of stuff, you know. So, so, so um, some of the, and, and their theology sits in the background until somebody comes along like a miner with the hard hat and starts digging it out and, and then going like, oh my gosh, look at this diamond. Like, um, Jacques Ellul is a French theologian and sociologist. Actually, he held the seat of institutes at Sorbonne University in France for years. He is, the nod to him is he's one of the best sociologists of the 20th century. He predicted every technological shift in the 20th century. And um, uh, he wrote 20 books on sociology and 20 on theology. Now, if you read him, it's like wading through wet concrete, right? But you find diamonds everywhere. And, and part of what I get to do and my friends, we want, to take, we, we want to take the diamonds of the early church and the diamonds of good theological work that's been done. It's like reading the Torrance brothers, who are the, two of the best theologians of the 20th century, Trinitarian to the core, Baxter trained under them. Baxter came out of the PCA, actually. And, and he would have, because his whole family is from Prentice, Mississippi, and you know his grandfather had the first telephone in the county. It was the number one. That's his phone number, was one. <laughs> and, um, and he was the county doctor and the county judge. And, and Baxter grew up with a full family of lawyers. He, he ended up, moving in the direction of theology, which was different than his whole family. But what changed him is that he was at Ole Miss University and he was reading God in the Dock by C.S. Lewis. And he, and he was, you know, Baxter's the kind of guy that reads footnotes. And God in the Dock has lots of footnotes. And he's going along in the footnotes and he, and he sees a quote by Athanasius or Athanasius. Uh, a book called On the Incarnation of the Word of God, written in about 320 A.D. by a 21-year-old North African who saved the early church in many respects. And um, Athanasius was a disciple of, is it Polycarp, who is a disciple of John. I think that's how it worked. And um, so Baxter goes to the Old Miss Library, which is different from the Old Miss Library, because there is a pub on campus called the library. <laughs> and Baxter's dad would call him up and says, how come I'm getting, are, aren't you returning your books? I'm getting bills from the library. <laughs> and um, so Baxter goes to the book library 
and he finds on the incarnation of the Word of God in the old Miss library that had never been taken out. And so it probably only has Baxter's name in the little card at the back, you know, as far as anybody who's taken that book out. But he reads on the incarnation of the Word of God, and it changes his life. And he's like, <gasps> who's talking about this stuff? Right? What was God to do being good and seeing that his cr good creation is on the road to ruin and about to lapse into non-being? That's Athanasius in 321 AD, right? What was God being good to do, seeing that his good creation is on the road to ruin and about to lapse into non-being? And he's like, <gasps> so he reads this, and it's a little tiny book, and, and he finds the Torrance brothers are deep into early church theology. Athanasius, Irenaeus, you know, Hillary, the Celtic tradition that came out of the early church that went a completely different way than the Western tradition that came out of, you know, Augustine and then Calvin and Luther and on. We went one, we're down one path and inherited that history. And, and the, the Celtic tradition, about that at some point, because it makes a huge amount of difference. So I want to introduce you to um, um, a, a word it's a philosophical word and it's a theological word. And it's, a, it's an important word because, because once you get it, all of a sudden, lots of things will just open up for you. And the, and the word in the Greek is ontos, O-N-T-O-S, from which we get ontology. Now, theology, theos is God. That's the symbol for God right there, right? Theo, theos. Theos is God. Logos is the word, so theology is words about God, yeah? And so, um, ontos, that word in the Greek means being, B-E-I-N-G, being. Like, what, it, what is your being? What's the truth of who you are, right? So, the, the words about the being of God. You follow? That's as complicated as we're going to get. Right? And um, because I'm going to use that a lot. Now, let's go over here, because we'll start here. So fun. I, I've, been, I've been using white, I never use whiteboards and stuff. This is like, I'm so thrilled I get to use pens and things like that. It's so great. And, and so, this is our, con our conversations about wholeness wholeness, right? What does it mean to be whole? Right? And, and you'd think, wait a second, if ontos is your being, wholeness, wholeness has got to be, here's the definition, when the way of your being, way, that's how you live and the choices you make and how you think and how you treat your neighbor and how you treat your enemy and all that, when the way of your being matches or expresses or incarnates the truth, the ontos of your being, the truth of your being. So wholeness is when the way of your being matches the truth of your being. What is the truth of your being? Because you do understand that the way of your being can be incredibly divergent from the truth of your being. Right? Even, even if you didn't think that the truth of your being was good, like a lot of us were taught inside of our modern evangelical religious tradition. And even if that, you still have a longing for the way of your being to be good. You want to be good. But the problem is that there's this big division between the way of your being and the truth of your being. So the fundamental question here is what is the truth of your being? That's the question. So, the way and the truth, right? So the way of your being is your existential experience. Existential, existing, how you live, okay? It's just, because I'm gonna use that, and not, to, to not confuse things here, I'm gonna use, because it's kind of a, 
A little bit of a technical term, sorry about that. But existential experience versus truth, which is your ontology. Okay? So that's just a, a background because we're going to come back to that over and over and over as we talk about something like the ontology of God. And that's where we're going to start because if you get the ontology of God right, suddenly all kinds of things get right. And some things become glaringly obvious that there is a problem in how we... Thank you. Well, there is a biggest fan right there. I got a smile from him last night. It's like, come on. So, here's where you get to help me. I want you to tell me the ontology of God. I want you to tell me things that are true about God, that are true, that are true, that are true, that are true. That are true. Yes. He's big. 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 How big? Like big, big. Big, big, right? Because he's big enough that all of creation is within God. Love. Okay, so I'll put love here. And, but this is not just any kind of love, right? This is not like infatuation or romantic love, right? This is, um, although the, the elements of romance are definitely in there, but this is agape, eh? Agape. Api. I want to write the Greek, but. So, um, agape or agape. Okay, okay, let's, good, we'll come to good in a second. But I want to focus on this agape, because this is a, if you're going to talk about the truth of Trinity, and actually, I would really prefer not to use the term God for a number of different reasons. One is, it's, it's nounified. And, and I, I'm okay with it, because it's a catch-all sort of thing, and we're all used to it, so it's common language. It's like calling this a church, right? It's wrong, but, you know. Because church is relationships between people. In fact, the true definition of the church is the relationship between the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. That's the church, right? So we call this building and stuff a church, but it's actually not, right? So we're, we're constantly lying to ourselves about that. But, but a lot of times when we say God, it, it's a catch-all. And, and it's a noun, and there's a problem with putting God into nouns. There just is. Because as soon as you do, it, you do that, you have created a box of some sort, right? What I love about the Hebrew is that God is a verb, fundamentally a verb. And it's not just any kind of verb, it's a being verb. I am that I am, or I think it's better, I am so I am. Okay? And we'll talk about that in a minute, which is very cool. But a, a being verb cannot be quantified. You can't put it in a box because it's actually living, moving, and active. Right? So, and it's unpronounceable in the Hebrew, which I even love even more. Because if you can't pronounce it, you can't put a box around it. So I, I love that. And I don't know if you knew this or not, but there is this really great thing happening inside the, uh, the Jewish uh, intellectual rabbinical community. They're starting to admit that they mistranslated the scriptures, their Hebrew scriptures, on purpose. Right? People wouldn't do that, would they? Hey, if you have a new international version, you've got mistranslations on purpose. David Bentley Hart in an interview recently just called the new international version thin tissues of deception. Right? Because people come with a particular paradigm and a theology, and they will see what they see what they see and not what's there. Right? I'm, I'm as prone to that as anybody. So you need to understand that. This is why the Holy Spirit has to be your teacher. Right? I can stand up here and do all kinds of things. The question is, what resonates here? Right? And, and people see what they see. You've seen that, um, if you go on YouTube and you look up uh, psychology experiment gorilla, right? You'll see this, they did this psychological thing, and what you do is they'll bring it up on a video and they'll say, okay, there's a team of like, I don't know, five or six people with white shirts on and a team with black shirts on, and there's a white ball that the white shirts are tossing between each other, and your job is to count 
how many times the white shirts toss the ball to each other. And it lasts for 30 seconds or whatever. And so you count them and you come up with 14. And, and they go, the answer is 14. And you feel so good about yourself like, look, I got an A. And, and uh, not, you know, but then they go like, so, did you see the man in the gorilla outfit? And you go like, what man in the gorilla outfit? And you go back and watch the video, and in the middle of the ball being tossed back and forth, out comes a huge gorilla. And he's right in the middle of everybody, and he's pounding his fist, and he's doing this, like this. You don't see him, because you're busy seeing what you think you need to be seeing. Right? That's a paradigm. That's, that's a powerful thing, that the eyes have a very limited view depending on who's behind it. Right? This is why the language about the Holy Spirit opening up your inside eyes becomes absolutely essential to the process of growth that you, that you are experiencing. And it happens from the inside out. Yeah, when we have a conversation like this, you are receiving things through your mind which has all kinds of barriers, right? You've got your history, your theology, what were you told by your dad, what, you know, what, what bad experiences you've experienced. And all of this stuff, right? It's all there. And so information comes running through that grid. And sometimes it actually gets through, you know. But, but at the same time, and this is why art and music and, and uh, film and creativity and all, all of that kind of stuff doesn't just come here. It also rises up here. And so you've got a lot better accessibility through this than through this. But as a human being, you can't actually change until there's a unification between these two, right? They say it's the, the biggest 18-inch gap in the universe between the head and the heart, right? And ask any man, it's true, you know? So, so if you're going to talk to a man about things of the heart, there's this word that's stuck right in their throat. And, and so, if you try to get there, and you go like, what are you, how are you feeling? What's the word? Fine. <laughs> fine, right? Fine. It covers a multitude of repression. And uh, it's like, fine, I'm fine. Everything's fine. And a lot of times it's because they are not in access to this because they were never allowed to be in access to that. They, that wasn't something that was developed, and then, then they're stuck. You know, so grant us a little grace, you know, because <laughs> we're having a hard time granting ourselves that kind of grace. And, and we have to actually learn to be human beings in ways that women naturally are connected to relationship, right? Okay, so agape is other-centered, self-giving, sacrificial love. Other-centered, self-giving, Sacrificial love. And, and that is the ontology of God. That is true. Now, somebody said, good. Good. In fact, you remember the conversation Jesus had with that young man whom he loved? And the young man's got an agenda, right? He wants to talk about, does he want to talk about his ontology, or does he want to talk about the way of his being? Right? Because we're going to do, look, look. We have the ontology of God. We have the way of God's being. We have the ontology of being human. Right? What does it mean to be a human being? And what is the way of being human? And then we have one more. Bad theology, okay? So, so that's kind of where we're going. So Jesus, this young man, wants to talk about what must I do to inherit eternal life, right? What must I do? So he's not talking about ontology, right? He's talking about existential experience. He's talking about the way of his being, right? What must I do to inherit eternal life? What does Jesus say to him? He, in fact, he starts with, good teacher, rabbi. Good, good teacher. 
what must I do to inherit eternal life? He's asking an existential way of being question. What is Jesus' response? Remember? Why do you call me good? What? That's not what he wants. He wants to know what he's supposed to do. He wants, what can I change about the way of my being so that I can get eternal life? And Jesus says, why do you call me good? There is no one who is good except God. Now, is Jesus saying, oh, confession time, I'm just not good. Is that what Jesus is saying? No. But Jesus responds to an existential question about the way of being with an ontological question. Why are you calling me good? There is no one good except God. So what he's actually asking is, young brother, why are you calling me good? Do you recognize in me the ontology of God? Are you calling me good because you know I'm good? But there's only one who is good. It's the same kind of question as, who do you think I am? Which is an ontological question. Right? So he's, he's got the young man sideways. Because the young man is religious. And he wants to ask a way of being question. And Jesus is pulling him immediately back into an ontological question. But the young man's stuck there. So Jesus then enters into his world, lowers the bar. If you're not going to talk to me about ontology, I'll talk to you about performance. If that's what you think you need, let's find a performance that's impossible for you. Because see, what you think, eternal life, which is an ontological existence, you think you can perform your way to it. You think you can change your ontology by changing your behavior. Ooh, that little thing just by itself should set off a few lightning strikes. Because, and it gets better. Trust me, this is great. God is good. God is good. What else? Personal. Personal. I just did uh, yesterday with Jonathan back there, Jonathan Parker, who's filming this and all that. And uh, Jonathan is instrumental in me being here. But yesterday, out of the kindness of his, um, his uh, business, we filmed a couple hours, three hours worth of stuff yesterday morning when I arrived. And, um, and it's uh, two of those hours, or an hour and a half of it, is for the Global Spiritual Awakenings Conference that they're going to put on the international web near the end of this month. And all the speakers you would consider as New Age. Except me. And, and because of the language that I use, and because of the shack and everything else, it has just opened up that entire world because it's about relationship and ontology. And they don't even know it. But one of the issues in this sort of amorphous spirituality, right? One of the issues is, is the divine personal, right? Big, it's a big deal. And, um, and it's one of the places that I get to talk about the Trinity and why that's so important as part of my tradition and why it overlays everything, which is another ontological reality of God which we're going to talk about more later. But, you know, we put little titles on this thing. Haven't, we just made it up. So, wholeness was a good place to start, but, you know, where it goes, don't know. And, uh, but we put Trinity in there just for fun. And uh, reconciliation, too, which is an outgrowth of what we're talking about, which we'll probably get to, but who knows. You know, so, Trinity. Three persons in oneness of relationship, the, 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 the quantum entanglement of these three persons is such that you can only describe them as oneness. But, but, 
And this is the perichoresis. This is the word perichoresis that the early church took, you know, 500 years to come up with to try to describe why we didn't believe in three gods, which was a big deal. And it's like, no, 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 this is not three gods. And, and out, of, out of this conversation came the early creeds, God of very God, you know. And so these things are really important. And because they wrestled with, did you know that in the early in the early couple few centuries, they had bar fights over the issue of the Trinity. <laughs> they did. People would get mad at each other in fisticuffs over the Trinity and what they were trying to say. And so, um, so Trinity, perichoresis is the big word, and it means, here's, here's my favorite definition of perichoresis. The, I love the word picture, which is the great dance. It's a great dance, right? And it's the circle dance, and it's but it's the mutual interpenetration of one with the other without the loss of personhood. The mutual interpenetration of one with the other without the loss of personhood. You know what that sounds like? Great sex. <laughs> Do you know? Why that's important? Because that's what it is. Sexuality is intended to mirror the relationship of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. It is the mutual interpenetration based on knowing, not imagination, based on knowing someone where personhood is never lost. The Spirit never becomes the Son or is never absorbed into the Son. The Spirit always is the Spirit, right? The Father never becomes the Spirit, although the Father is Spirit. You follow? So there is persons here, but the, there, is, there is no way to describe them except to say that we believe in one God, right? If we're going to categorize it, it's one God, but and, and here's the beauty, I told you that the Hebrews are having this little re revelation. Well, it's not a revelation, it's finally the rabbis are starting to admit something that they mistranslated. And it was on purpose because, and, and you go and you start talking to them or reading their stuff and they did it because they didn't think the common person would have the capacity to understand what, they, what was in the text. But a hundred, at least 195 times, they took the word, you know, the, the four letters, the, the unpronounceable name of God, which we have turned into Jehovah, right? That says Yahweh or Jehovah. That's, they're trying to indicate the out-breath and the in-breath, the movement of spirit in and out. The, you know, all of this is inside of that four letters. And... and um, they took that word and they 195 times changed it to Adonai, which we translate as Lord. So when we run into it, like in Genesis, every time you read, and the Lord God, right? Guess what it actually says? And Yahweh, Yahweh. And they admit, like Rabbi, uh, Rabbi Nasi, he says, we have always known that there was plurality within the being of the oneness of God. We have always known. Because Elohim is at least three. There is a form of Elohim that is singular, a form that is plur uh, dual, but this ain't it. The way it is in Genesis 1 is three or more. And the pronouns are all plural. Let us, in our, right? So they've always known there was plurality within the being of God, but they didn't think people would kind of get that, so they pulled back and they, they gave the Adonai name to the Yahweh so that we would just think we were talking about one God. It's called the Lord God, right? And yet there's a distinction between, actually there are three Yahwehs that are used in the Hebrew. Yahweh who is the Word, Yahweh who is the Spirit, and the other Yahweh. Well, I wonder what that sounds like. So, so inside the Hebrew language, there's already, this is already a setup. So here's one of my favorite verses. And you know the word for the Holy Spirit specifically is Ruach, which is feminine, by the way. 
almost all the verbs in Hebrew are feminine, and almost all the nouns are masculine. Interesting, eh? But the Spirit is feminine. And, and it's not to advocate the fact that the Holy Spirit is the female part of God. No. All of femaleness originates in the Father, in the Son, and in the Holy Spirit, right? So that's like my friend Tony said. He says, I can't believe all those years, he's a pastor, right? I can't believe all those years, we just thought that the, that the universe was birthed into being by three men in love with each other. Right, it's like... <laughs> so, so, we have Ruach. Now, listen to this. This is, this is what it says. And they heard the sound of the Lord God walking in the cool of the day. Remember that? Here's the Hebrew. And they heard the sound of Yahweh, Yahweh, walking in the Ruach. Oh yeah, wow. Oh yeah, that changes it a bit, right? You have the Trinity right there. And they've been encompassed inside that relationship, which has a lot to do with how Genesis then unfolds. But, but again, Trinity. So we've got big, big, love, good, personal, Trinity, what else? Tell me the ontology of God. Powerful. Powerful. Yes. What else? Whole. Is that what I heard? Whole. Yes. Which, by the way, comes from the same root as holiness. Holiness, which is a term that scared the crap out of a lot of us. You know, it was, that's what pushed God away from us, was the idea of holiness. Because the ontology of God is perfection and beautiful, you know, beautiful, right? And, uh, and so our, our sense of holiness was, he can't look on sin. He is, right? And he's distant. It's sort of an antiseptic purity of which we can't even get close to, right? So, so that was our sense of what holiness was. It had to do with the fact that God is sinless and we are sinful, right? So it creates a sense of separation. And then to add to that sense, we wrote a whole bunch of hymns and songs and stuff to exacerbate that sense. So we continued to push God further and further away. And then we got mad when they wrote a pop song, God is watching us from a distance. I mean, that's very evangelical, but, but it's like that, right? So there's this big gap of separation. And, and worship meant that we constantly told God how distant he was, because that's, that's worship, right? Because he's not like us, he's God. And therefore, we have to have him at a distance. And he can't look on sin. And, he, and so, well, there's a problem, isn't it? But anyway, that's what it says in Habakkuk. Well, it says that in half a verse in Habakkuk. And we're good at half verses, because half verses can suit your needs way better than a whole verse. <laughs> you know? The actual verse in Habakkuk is, you are so beautiful, your eyes are so pure, you are so enlightened that you cannot look on sin. So why do you? Oh, that's the other half of the verse. Ooh, that's a problem. Let's just forget that half of verse because we need the purity of God and the distance of God. As if distance creates a sense of reverence and awe. Tell that to a parent. If you really want to have a sense of reverence or awe about your child, you need to put him as far away from you as possible. And go from a distance. Oh, wow, that's my child. So distant. But good and pure. And No, it's actually when you get to know them that your sense of awe and reverence expands. Like, did you see what they did? Look at this picture. You should see what Jonathan's little girl sent to me this morning in a little, she drew a picture. She said, I love you because of little 
our little interaction last night, and she's got a picture of me and Anna, who she is, and her little brother Joel, and it's the most, that's like no Picasso will even get close to that thing, right? It's like the best. And it's because we've gotten to know each other a little bit. It's proximity that creates reverence, not distance. This is one of the reasons we love Jesus. Because Jesus is not a distant God. Jesus is right with us. And not only that, in us. Like how, like, how much closer can you get? And the Spirit is your very breath. Like, what's God trying to say here? You know? Again. So wholeness, holiness. Do you, here's my, here was one of my aha moment questions when I was starting to think differently <laughs> from my tradition and uh, from my upbringing, from my paradigm. And that was, so... Do you think God was holy before there was any sin? Because our, our sin consciousness is such that it seems like, you know, oh, no, he started being holy when we screwed up. Really? Is holiness ontological or is it God's way of being? It's ontological. Holy, holy, holy. Is thou Yahweh, Yahweh? The Lord God Almighty. Huh. Right? So, ontologically, that means it's true that it's true that it's true, that is independent of ways of being. It's, it's true. God has always been holy. That means God was holy before there was any sin, which means ontologically, holiness has got nothing to do with sin at all. What did we do? We took it from the ontology of God and we turned it into the way of being. We made holiness about the way of being, sin. So what else is true about God? Not you have to define that. Well, that's what you're here for. Sweet. <laughs> Okay, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to put non, like this, judgmental. Okay? Because I understand what you're saying. Right? You're saying in the way that we judge one another, God is not like that. But I'm telling you God is a judge. And the early church would say God is a judge. Throughout history, we'd say God is a judge. So he's judgmental, but he's not judgmental like we are. In fact, there's all these words for judgment and punishment and all this. There's only one, timoreo, which is the kind of judgment that we do against each other. It's, and it's never used for God. It's only used for human beings. And it means punitive and retributive. That's what we mean by non-judgmental. It's not punitive, nor is it retributive. Retributive. Um, uh, um, you did this, so I have to do this. Right? Retribution. Retribution. Yep. 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 So, so how is God the judge? Now, this is stunning because I told you that there are these two paths, right? There's this path that goes into Celtic side and Eastern Orthodox more so and all this. And then there was the Western path. Both of us had a model of God as judge, but they were fundamentally different. So, in our Western tradition, God as judge was in a courtroom. Why? Well, Augustine was a lawyer, Calvin was a lawyer, Luther was a lawyer, right? And seriously, we went, well, of course, God's a judge like in a, in a courtroom. All right, so let's, let's play that out. God is the judge behind the Bema seat or whatever you want to say, you know, he's the judge. And and you come into the courtroom, are you guilty or are you innocent? We kind of all come in there guilty, you know, and we're hoping Jesus is our advocate that'll stop the judge from the punitive and retributive justice, right? Because we're going to say justice is, justice is you have to pay for what you did. Yeah? 
leaving out the fact that eternal conscious torment is a big deal, like, you know, yeah, I'm sorry you were six years old, but you never did the magic sinner's prayer thing, so, sorry, eternal conscious torment. Like, what did I do? Well, you're just bad, that's what you did, you know? We have some problems here, right from the get-go, right? So the judge, you come into the courtroom, and the judge, the job of the judge is to determine whether you're guilty or innocent, and then the job of the judge is then to prescribe punishment, supposedly equivalent to the amount of damage that you did. Which, which brings us into a huge problem, even in our culture, in our world. How does, how does killing someone heal the loss of the person and the, and the missingness of the person that they killed? Or how does, how does life imprisonment offset the loss of the lives that they were involved when they were under the influence and all that. You know, you, you start getting into this quandary. Remember Jesus, he comes and he goes like, you've heard it said, and he's quoting law. Eye for an eye. But I say to you, and he moves into an entirely different reality that is non-forensic. Forensic theology has to do with courtroom theology, legal theology, right? So you've got God is a judge. His job, the job is to determine whether you're guilty or innocent, guilty, and then to prescribe punishment, eternal conscious torment. Or if, if you did the magic prayer, you get a pass. So you can go to the, and Jesus said, I, did, I took it for you. I took it for the whole world, but it only works for you because you said the magic words. And... Um, so, and God the judge is going like, yeah, let him in, he, he has the pass, you know? Yeah, I, I beat the hell out of you so that I could let him in, right? Okay. I mean, I'm, our, what's our concepts here? They're all kind of screwed up. So, that's our tradition. That's where I came from. What happened with the other one that went through Hillary and the Celtics and all that? They had God as judge. But guess what their model was? Not a courtroom. Hospital. The great physician judge. Now, if you go to a doctor, is that doctor going to judge you? I hope so. They're going to tell me what's broken. They're going to tell me why I'm sick. They're going to tell me what this wound is all about. They're going to figure out what's happening inside my body, right? They're going to judge me. And then they're going to punish me. We're going to cut you open and take this little thing out, right? Or we're going to, we're going to force you to take these antibiotics, you know? What's the point of the judgment of a doctor? To heal you. To heal you. That's the whole goal. That's the Hippocratic Oath. That's the, I'm not going to do more harm to you, right? I'm going to do everything I know how to save you. Do you understand what a different kind of judge that is? Do you understand why George MacDonald would then write, if you trust the ontological goodness of God, you will run to him, and say, please, judge me to the core, and burn, here's another one, fiery, I'll just leave it at fire because I can't remember how to spell fiery, <laughs> fiery fury. That is true about the ontology of God. And a lot of people who are all about grace only kind of stuff, my people, again, you know, that have switched from, I'm, forget the law, we're all grace now, you know. They don't know what to do with this still. And, but they know what to do with that as parents, but we'll get into that. And, um, but again, he says, if you trust the goodness of God, you will run to him with your arms wide open and you will say, please, come and judge me to the core and burn out of me Everything that keeps me from being fully human and fully alive. 
which is exactly what God is after. Why? Because he loves you. And if you are a parent who has any health at all, this is exactly how you work. You are opposed to anything that is in the life of the one you love that keeps them from being fully human and fully alive. If you've got a, a son who's an addict, you hate the addiction uh, because you love your son. And so you will participate in any way to try to destroy that thing that is in them that keeps them from being fully human and fully alive. Do you understand how like, bing, this begins to open up because we're starting with the ontology of God. How about kind? How about patient? How about long-suffering? How about pure of heart? How about self-controlled? What am I doing? Oh, fruit of the Spirit. It's not like there's a bunch of containers in heaven, like the patience container and the long-suffering container, and you're there praying, please give me some patience, you know? So he gets a spoonful of patience to help the medicine go down, and he gives you a spoonful of patience, and pretty soon it runs out, and you're impatient again, and you go like, I need another spoonful of patience, and so you've got the fruit of the Spirit, like, Holy Spirit, just give me something, because I'm just like at a loss here, and, um, and, um, no, it's a description of God. The fruit of the Spirit is a description of the Holy Spirit. Guess what? The Holy Spirit is God. Yeah? Okay. Now, we could go on and on and on in this list, but I, I really am thrilled that Fiery Fury is on here because this has a real long-term effect on lots of the conversations that we're having. This is not, this, I'm quoting George MacDonald again, this is not a God who will stand idly by while anything that is not of love's kind remains in you. Part, and we'll get to this conversation at some point, but part of why hell is so painful, and hell, by the way, is the combination of fiery fury and which is love. It's not a combination. It is love that is a fiery fury because God is a consuming fire. And what is the intention of that consumption? What is he consuming? You? No. Hell no. <laughs> God is consuming everything that is in... God's intent is not to heal sin. God's intent is to destroy it. God's intent is not to make death okay, it's to destroy it and the fear of it, which he did in Jesus. Okay? So we could go on and on and on about the ontology of God. And this is, this is kind of like super important. And you'll see why. Because if you get... I gotta put this up somewhere. I'll put it up over here. So, because if you get the ontology of God wrong, you're gonna get everything wrong. Okay, thanks. So a lot of our conversations, a lot of our theological conversations are because we're confused about the ontology of God. We don't understand the truth of God's being. And so we, and I, let me give you a common example. Because it litters our language. We got ontology wrong. Oh, um, let me add another one to this. Parent, eh? Parent. Hmm. The ontology of God, that God is a parent. Okay, and that's going to come up because of some other important things. But, but, and, add apologies. Because, um, because, because you did it in the prayer. 
And we do it commonly. And we do it in our language. And it's because we didn't get something right about the ontology of God. So we will say things like, he's being used by God. We will say that because our ontology is screwed up. Oh, guess what another word on there should be? Submission. This is a God who submits by nature. Submission is part of God, right? So, submission. You have a constant mutual submission of the Father to the Son, and the Son to the Father, and the Father to the Spirit, and the Spirit. I mean, it's exactly what your heart would go like. That would be like the most best relationship ever, where you're actually seen for who you are, and you're, 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 you matter, and and. You're loved for who you are, and there is this interplay of relationships such that everything becomes an expression of it. So, would you ever say to your child as a parent, or your grandchild as a grandparent, someday I'm going to use you. <laughs> when you grow up, you're going to be a tool that I can use. I mean, you laugh. We talk like that all the time. And we even pray like that, please use me. And God's going like, no. Because this God uses nobody. Here's a good verse. Every once in a while, it's always good to have a good verse. The God who made the world and Everything in it, since he is Lord of heaven and earth, does not dwell in temples made with hands, nor is God served by human hands as though he needed anything. Oops. No needs. Huh? That's ontologically true about God. This God has no needs. Yeah? And is not a liar. God is a truth teller. Right? Hebrews. God cannot lie. Right? He is not served by human hands as though he needed anything, since he, he himself gives to everyone life and breath and all things. Of course, you know, in my tradition, all never means all. It only means all of those who did something, you know, and so it's like all is not all. And it's like, no, all is all, like all. You know, he gives to everyone life. Well, that can't be right, because, you know, they're dead in their trespasses and sins, right? Ah, remind me of that verse. We'll get back to it. All right. But again, God doesn't use anybody. Why? Because the Father never uses the Spirit, and the Spirit never uses the Son. It is not part of relationship that is authentic and real and good. Submission is, but the Father submits to the Spirit. Right? It's mutuality. It's this great dance. God would never say, submit one to another, if that wasn't already true about the very nature of God. We can deal with that passage if you want, at some point. But, but okay, so, so now we're going to talk about the way of God's being. Now remember, wholeness or holiness is when the way of your being matches the truth of your being. So what is the way of God's being? How does God actually act? Same list. Same list! Oh my God! It's the same list! Because God is a truth teller, God will never lie. So if you've got a passage where it seems like God is lying, Either the writer got it wrong, their perception of God was wrong, 
Or there's something about it we just don't understand. Because if, if ever, if ever the way of God's being is not an incarnation expression or matches the truth of God's being, God flies apart. God is no longer holy, is no longer whole. You follow? This is kind of important. This is partly why we have a problem reading the Hebrew Scriptures, the Old Testament. And we seem to have a God whose way of being doesn't match the truth of being. What is the greatest revelation of the ontology of God? The Bible? Or Jesus? See, I believe in the inherent, infallible Word of God, and His name is Jesus. We, what, you know what we did? We deified Scripture. And in my tradition, we not only deified Scripture, we replaced the Holy Spirit with it. And our Trinity ended up the Father, Son, and the Holy Bible. In our tradition, the Holy Spirit quit somewhere around the end of the first century. You know, this is why in our tradition, proof of the work of God in your life was not speaking in tongues. It was actually the opposite, a quiet time. So in this tradition, you had to speak in a language you didn't understand. In this tradition, you had to keep your mouth shut. Funny. So again, we deified Scripture. We made Scripture, we put Scripture in a place that it doesn't even take for itself. And then we have no objectivity of how to even look at it. Because we're constantly trying to make excuses for God so that the way of God's being continues to match the truth of His being. And it puts us into all kinds of theological conundrums. Because how... Oh, listen to this verse. This is from Samuel. One of my favorite verses ever. For we, human beings, will surely die. Great start. Very encouraging. For we will surely die and are like water spilled on the ground which cannot be gathered up again. Yet, God does not take away life, but always plans ways so that the banished one will not be cast out. 2 Samuel 14, 14. Is that an ontological statement? Is it telling us the truth of who God is? That God does not take life. And you think about it. Is the ontology of God in this list? Tell me what you don't find. Evil. You don't find evil. You don't find hate. What else? Death. You don't find death. Death isn't in that list. What else don't you find? Darkness, bondage, greed, avarice. Oh, you do find wrath, and you do find anger. But it's in the ontology of God. But how do, what is it after? Yeah, 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 yeah. So, so, all of those things aren't in God. So if you've got a situation where you're reading a passage of Scripture, and you're going like, oh my gosh, he's a killer. Something's wrong. Here's part of the beauty of Scripture, and I love Scripture. You know, it's inspired. And that, that it claims for itself. It's inspired. But so is Elton John. <laughs> Maybe not the same way. But, but I'm telling you, there's a reason that Presbyterian pastors and elders will go to an Elton John concert and raise their hands, something they would never do in church. Why is that? Because they completely disagree with the way of his being. Because Elton John participates. And this is the difference between a God who doesn't use you and a God who is mutuality. This is a God who constantly invites participation. That's the word that has to replace being used by God. I've been invited to participate. I got to participate. Look at this. I'm a parent. I get to participate. 
God's not using me to love my child. I'm actually the incarnation of that love to this child. I get to participate. You follow? So, Elton John participates. And, and frankly, because he's not religious and stuck inside religious ideology, he's able to write about the human condition in ways that touch us to our humanity because religious people, they don't even know how to write a decent love song. Right? And so what you hear from the religious side is like, I mean, how are you going to write decent songs when you only have a vocabulary of 250 words? You can basically put all worship songs inside 250 words, and it's like, great, let's rearrange them again. <laughs> See if it has an impact this time. You know? They add really good music. You know, if you add good music, you create better propaganda. That's just the way that it is, right? The, the more creative what comes around it. And so, <laughs> I was at Belmont, and they have all these music degrees and stuff. And, you know, I'm careful, really. For whatever reason, I get to have a lot of freedom here this morning, which is kind of nice. And so thank you for that. Because I'm, I'm, I am sensitive to where people are at. And, and, but you wouldn't be here today in this setting and situation if something wasn't going on that you're saying... I know there's more. I just know there's more. There's always been a sense that there's more. And I've been stuck. I hit a glass ceiling or something, right? So I, I was speaking to them. I got up in their chapel. And I, I said, I got two questions for you right off the bat. One is, why are you singing old songs? I mean, you have this entire music department. Where's your music, right? And then why did you pick songs that are full of lies? And they're like, <gasps> you know? And so I went back through the last song we sang, and I, I go, the music's great. Look, see? Music. Because the, 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 the accompaniment actually exacerbates the problem. Because look, this sentence, a lie, it's a lie. Here's why it's a lie. This sentence, a lie. That's a lie, too. And so I went through and just dismantled the song, right? And, and I had the freedom that I wouldn't do that in some places, because it's too big a leap, yeah? And you, you have no right to drag someone through the bars of their prison, even for their own good. You might call it their prison, but they might call it home. And you have no right to take something that is precious to someone and make it less precious by the end of your conversation. You follow what I'm saying? If what we are learning and growing in does not increase our capacity to love, we're just playing more mind games. That's all we're doing. We're just finding a new way to feel better about ourselves. That's why I call my people my people, because they're my people. Yeah, they, don't, they have a problem with the shack, and they've said horrible things about me, and yeah, they don't know what they're doing, really. They're speaking out of lies that they believe about their own ontology, let alone the ontology of God. So, so what do we do then with those passages that seem like the way of God's being is absolutely contrary to the truth of God's being? If the truth of God's being is Jesus, you've got to put Jesus back into those passages and have him slaughtering babies. Isn't that a problem to you? Especially when Samuel comes, it wasn't Samuel who said it, actually it was a woman, who says, God doesn't take life. Why would he? The ontology of God doesn't include death. It's not like, oh, we got death to use now to accomplish good things. The ends don't justify the means, and if the means are ontologically contrary to the character of God, God won't use them to accomplish good as if the good then justifies the means. Now, that is not to say that God is not a redeeming genius, but God will climb into disaster and disease and dysfunction and despair, and God will begin to work inside of respect and honoring and dignifying and loving and submitting to accomplish good because God is good without resorting to use and, and we do this because we, we want to say the right thing, you know? Well, at least he's in a better place or, you know, 
This is part of God's plan. Ooh, God. As if sin and death is part of God's plan. Like we're stuck in some fatalistic determinism of a God who is a split character somewhere between good and evil. God is never the author of evil. Ever. Ever. God is only good and good all the time. And the way of God's being is good. Jesus doesn't come to try to convince God the Father that humans are worth saving. Jesus came to convince humanity about the nature and character of God that they didn't even understand. And if they didn't get God right, they couldn't get themselves right. I don't know what we're doing time-wise. Ooh, okay. Okay, that's a good start, eh? <laughs> so, to, to summarize briefly, Oh, I, I do have to finish this one piece about scripture, right? Because it's like, woo, what are you saying, you know? You have to understand that scripture is accomplishing two things. It's the unfolding narrative, the unfolding history, using every kind of poetic and narrative and historic genres. It's the unfolding of how God worked inside the corrupted, disrupted, dark blindness of humanity to reveal the truth of God's own very character, nature, and being. That's one thing. But in doing that, it also exposes how blind we have been about the nature and character of God. And so, God doesn't take out all the blindness parts and all the ugly parts and all the parts where we completely misunderstand the character of God. And we then, you know, because back in the day, they believed that everything that happened to you was a result of your behavior. So it was like, you know, quid pro quo, to use a common word that's being bandied about these days. I'm a Canadian, so I can say that. And um, so, so... It's like, it's like if something bad happens to you, it's because you're bad. This is, and that, that mentality continued to exist right into the disciples. Remember the man born blind? So whose fault is this, right? Was it his parents or him? He was born blind. Like, how would you even ask the question if it was his fault, right? <laughs> but again, the mentality is there. And Jesus is going like, no, it's got nothing to do with whose fault it is. It's so that today you're going to see the activity of God who is good. It didn't even answer their question about the odyssey, right, or the problem of evil. And it's like, no, you don't understand. And, and so in Scripture, what is the story of Abraham and Isaac? The story of Abraham and Isaac is not a story of God needs to be priority number one in your life, and to prove it, you need to be willing to sacrifice your child which was how it was taught in missions so that our parents would send us away to boarding school and sacrifice their relationship with their kids because people were going to hell and we were told if we talked about the abuse that was happening in boarding school, there would be people who would be in hell because we'd affected the mission. And our parents were swallowing the lie that they needed to prove to God that God was number one, like God needed the attention and they needed to prove to God that they were willing to lay down that which is absolutely most precious to them, which is their child. And they did it. And my generation got slaughtered in the name of the gospel. And you're wondering why all these missionary kids are so angry and so bitter and so lost. Because of Abraham and Isaac. Just because we interpreted that scene that way doesn't mean that that's what that means. But that's Bible. No, it's not. You know what that story's about? Abraham is completely a pagan. You understand? He comes to Ur the Chaldees, and they have a moon god and goddess worshiping center to Nanu and Ningal. Sounds like something out of Mork and Mindy, but... 
you know, when he's saying Nanu Nanu, that's the name of a god in Ur of the Chaldees. And, and so, um, so it's like, there's no Bible school there. It's like, no, he's had no theological education. Like, uh, you know, on, on, on a scale of spirituality, he's got his foot in A. Right? He's a pagan. He, does, he knows nothing. Oh, but he moves a foot into B. So he's got one in B and one in A because, you know, because he, he hears voices. Gosh, am I losing my mind? Nobody else hears voices. I'm having this experience, this encounter. What is this? I don't know. But suddenly, I'm hearing this voice tell me, get out of town. <laughs> well, we know, we know that God is, you know, geographically bound. So let's take all the other gods with us and see if one of them is going to show up wherever we go. So they did. They pack up all their gods and goddesses and then and they leave town. So now he's moved, he's moved, he's left town, right? He's gone out of his denomination and he's moved. He's now starting a new church, the church of the voice that I don't know who it is telling me to go somewhere I don't know where, right? He's now in B. When you get to B after you've left A, right? When you move to B, now you think everybody in A is an idiot. I'm so glad I'm not there anymore, right? They're just idiots, you know? And if you run into somebody like Melchizedek who's in, you know, Q or something, <laughs> you're going like, huh, they're just nuts, right? They just, they don't know. So we got a B church here. Now, to be or not to be, this is it. This is our church, you know? <laughs> idiots to the left of me, crazy people to the right of me. We've arrived, yeah? How does God break into Abraham's blindness? And here's what we want God to do. We want God to show up and have a one-on-one -on -one going like, hey, let me get a whiteboard out here and tell you the truth about everything, right? And Abraham would be going like, what did you say your name was? <laughs> right, because that's one of the ways that God started telling him about who he was. was okay, I got a new name for you today. Right? For me. I want you to rec recognize that this is true about me. Right? That's how it's the slow unwinding thing. What does God speak to Abraham? What language? Does he come with God language? No. Because Abraham, he's in B. He's barely out of Ur the Chaldees language. And he's actually stuck in it way more than he thinks he is. Right? He's drug Ur the Chaldees with him. And he's, he's still got his Nanu Ningal thing going on, and he doesn't even realize it. All he knows is he's got an encounter, he's going somewhere he doesn't know, and so he's now here. And what language does God speak to Abraham? Because Abraham's a missionary. I mean, God's a missionary to Abraham. What is it? He does, he speaks Ur, or Nangalism. I don't know, whatever. He speaks Abraham's language. I'm a missionary kid. I don't know any missionary that they go to a culture that has never heard English. They're an English-speaking missionary. And they go speaking English and get angry at people for not understanding them. It just, it'd be absurd, yeah? So why would God come to Abraham and speak God language when Abraham's like totally stuck in his own? God speaks Abraham's language. And religiously, what is Abraham's language? Sacrifice. Sacrifice, yes. In fact, it's everybody on the planet's language. Religiously, you go, you go to the Aztecs and the Incans, guess what they're speaking? Sacrifice, right? And if you go to Marduk or Baal or Odin or Thor or the Mesopotamian or the Egyptian gods, everybody's about sacrifice. We still have that today. Right? We call it things like patriotism. Ooh, ooh, don't go there. Okay. All right. Sorry. Sorry, sorry, sorry. I have a son who's a cop, so it gives me a little bit of privilege. And I have, my ring comes from special forces guys. So I, I understand the sacrifice that these men and women have made. But I use that term clearly. Right? Because... I know. We have a, a granddaughter adopted from Uganda, and while my son was in Uganda for eight weeks trying to get her out, 
Um, six little boys went missing within a one square mile area because for 80 bucks US you can buy a child that will be stolen and then body parts of that child will be put in the corners of new businesses and new construction in order to keep the evil spirits away. Sacrifice. Now we don't do that because we're so civilized that, but, but we will sacrifice our sons and our daughters to what? Personal peace, affluence, imagination of safety and security, right? And we will write hymns about it and songs about it and we will put it under pomp and circumstance and we will, right? And that doesn't deny the sacrifice that young men and women are making on behalf of a civil religious system that exists in order to maintain and perpetrate its existence as a nation state which is all based on violence. I'm talking about the reality of the kingdom of God and how we have to come to the place where we're in the world, but we're not of it. That's a tough one for, especially I think in a world like America, you know, that's a hard one. And, um, and, and because they think you're dishonoring if you, if you expose the travesty of a sacrificial system. And it is. So Abraham speaks sacrifice. So what is God? And, and this is why, doesn't it bother you when God says, kill your boy? Abraham goes, okay. Doesn't that bother you? Well, that's how disconnected Abraham's head is from his heart. He is so disassociated as a human being, as a man, that he is willing to sacrifice his son because that's his language. He thinks that by doing that, he is doing something good. And so God speaks his language, says, sacrifice your son. Because see, we have an advantage. We know about what God thinks about sacrifice. We know about what the prophets have told us about sacrifice and that God hates it. Hates it. See, and because we're still stuck in that sacrificial language, we even created atonement theories that are based on the need of God, who needs nothing except sacrifice, that this God needs a sacrifice. And somehow God, who is the Father, is different from God, who is Jesus, the Son, because Jesus doesn't need a sacrifice. Who's sacrificing someone to Jesus? Right? So he doesn't need one, but God the Father needs one. And, 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 and God the Father needs to be appeased, right? And so we create a sacrificial system based on that. It's a problem. It denies the deity of Christ, for one thing. That atonement theory denies the deity of Christ. And it's the dominant atonement theory in America, in, especially in this part of the world, this part of America. We've inherited that. That's my people's atonement theory. We didn't think it was a theory, we just thought it was the truth. The thing about theories, they can become truth without us even realizing it. And, uh, and we know where it came from, we can trace it. Thank you, Anselm. So, um, so again, God speaks Abraham's language. Sacrifice your son. Abraham says, okay. Knife's coming down. God says what? Stop. And this is when Abraham learned that God was Jehovah, Yahweh, the provider. What does that mean? Here's what it means. Abraham, two things I want you to understand right now. Right off the bat, right at the beginning of all this, I do not do child sacrifice. Number one. Number two, if you need a sacrifice, I will provide myself. If you need a sacrifice, I will provide myself. But I know you're still stuck in Ur of the Chaldees and all of that kind of stuff. So I know you're still stuck in sacrifice and all that kind of stuff. So there will be a lamb that will deal with this. But for now, here is a goat. Accommodation. 
submission. So, this is why, and people don't like to acknowledge this in my people group, Paul the Apostle disagrees with Moses, and it's right in the Scripture. But we don't want to see that he disagrees with Moses. He, we don't want to see that Paul the Apostle turns around and says, Moses was wrong. Because we like to quote Moses, especially if we're pissed off at somebody. Paul quotes Deuteronomy, and it's actually a really big deal. And Paul, who is the Jewish scholar of the world at the time under Gamaliel, is no slouch about what he's doing when it comes to using the Hebrew Scriptures. Because he sees the ontology of God all over Hebrew Scriptures. And he's constantly calling it forward, running it through the person of Jesus, so that it makes sense to us as the revelation seen through Jesus. If you're going to look at Hebrew scriptures, you've got to look through Jesus. Do not do it independent of Jesus, because we know the truth of Jesus being, and we know the way of Jesus being, because he is the incarnation of the way of God that matches the truth of God. And Paul says, he quotes the Deuteronomy passage, that goes like this. Cursed by God is every man who hangs upon a tree. That's Deuteronomy. Paul, cursed is every man who hangs upon a tree. Did Paul just like forget to quote the whole verse or does he just like he missed it or? No, he is correcting Moses. There is a rule of interpretation that says, um, Repetition without redundancy equals interpretation. When you repeat something, but not exactly the same, you are interpreting. Paul is interpreting. He is saying, yes, people who are hung on a cross, on a tree, are cursed, but not by God. And that agrees with Isaiah. We spat on him. We turned our back on him. We cursed him. And we esteemed him stricken by God and afflicted. We did it, but we esteemed him stricken by God. We said, see, cursed by God is every man who hangs upon a tree. And Isaiah says, that's how blind we're going to be. We're going to blame the death of Jesus on the Father. So what do you do with Samuel who says, God doesn't take away life, and then, and God told Samuel to kill all the animals, and then got pissed off at him because he left some animals still alive, but he killed all the babies, and he killed all the women, and he, you know, he left a few guys, and what's going on there? And this is part of the beauty of Scripture. God includes all of our blindness as part of the story, like, hmm. Yep, still stuck, still thinking that God is a, is a killer, still thinking that violence... You know, you know what that atonement theory does? That God would pour out his wrath on his son in order to be right with other people? You know what that atonement theory does? It communicates that the greatest act of love, the cross, is violence. That violence is the greatest act of love. Is killing. What makes that God any different from Baal or Marduk or Cain killing Abel? Our view of God has got to be grounded in the ontology of God as revealed in Jesus and not in doctrinal theology that actually denies the truth of God by giving God ways of being that are contrary to his nature. And this is why scripture is, if you, if you look at it objectively, like theologians are trying to do, they recognize that there are editors who have a theological position in opposition to each other, struggling over the same text. And this is why in, in, in one book it'll say about the same event, God did this, and in another one it'll say Satan did this. About the same thing because you've got two different editors with a different theological perspective trying to duke it out. 
What does this mean? Can you not trust scripture? You can trust scriptures to be a revelation, unfolding revelation of God. You can trust scriptures that they are also telling us how blind and duped we are. And as we come into the New Testament, you can trust the record of Jesus and those who knew him. And more, you can trust the Holy Spirit, who is the same Holy Spirit who was the teacher of those before there was a printing press. It's not like, finally, we got a Bible. Now we can have some certainty. That's why we have 44,000 denominations. Right? Because everybody's right. There's a problem. So, when you run into a passage where it seems like the way of God's being as represented in that passage is not an expression of the truth of God's being as revealed in Jesus that you have come to know, a couple things. One is understand that that's the way they thought. That's how they interpreted it. That's what they did with that story. You know? And, and yet, even in those horrible stories, you'll find woven redemptive golden threads of the presence of God trying to destroy the ideology that is false. But this is a God who submits by nature. Bummer. Right? Don't you just want God to just fix you without you having to do anything? You know? Extreme soul makeover, you know? Send me to Disney World and fix me by the time I get back? And God is going, you have no idea how magnificent you are, and I will not violate the intricate beauty of how you're crafted just because you think that we can do a quick fix here. You cannot come to healing apart from your participation.